we had a little lull. We had had a little lull around Thanksgiving. Um, I didn't publish for a couple of weeks because the of the holidays and everything. But you take a look at the last seven days of a market activity. We've returned really to a level that we saw after Ian. So a lot of new listings, sold um, a little down a little bit. Pending six seventy nine. Pendings are up a little bit. And price decreases continue to um, be substantial. 66, 660, add that to 726 new listings, and you've got a lot of new opportunities in the market. And um, just search in the uh, residential marketplace. We can see that if we search just active listings, for those of you that don't know this little trick you can hit results when it goes to 5,000 plus you can click on that and it will tell you that we now have 7,633 active listings in, in the MLS right now that's up from half of that I believe was, was what it was when we started the year so listings I think are about double close to double um, what they we were when we started the year. Um, however, the predictions for consumption are are, are quite a bit down. Uh, they said on the Keller Williams call this morning that units could be down thirty percent from last year. So, and obviously, that's not a great picture when you take a look at listings for twenty twenty two. We're down thirty percent from twenty twenty one. So the picture is that. While supply will continue to go up, the number of units being forecast for sale next year is going to be down. So when you do your business planning, you got to figure out, well, what do I need to do to take market share to add so I can achieve the number of units that I had, you know, back in 2022. So the other, the good news is through all of this is prices seem to continue to hold. Uh, they continue to look like they're up for um, over, and, and we'll take a look at the individual stats here. I'm going to have the graphs ready for tomorrow's sales meeting, so we'll have those out tomorrow, but uh, we can take a quick dive into the stats here. So if we're looking, let's look at uh, our usual suspects, Collier. And Lee, so looking at the um, numbers here, this is median closed price. You can see in Lee County, it was up 7% over last year, but it's still tracking downward from um, from from the previous couple months. Collier County has seen a slight increase uh, of of the, the over the past couple months. It's five sixty to five seventy to six thirty two, and it's up twenty two percent over uh, twenty twenty two. So unit volume down, but selling prices holding at least through the median of the selling prices. Uh, a couple things about the median price. Obviously, you know it's the middle, and when the number of sales go down, as they have, you can see the number of total sales is going down. Got a little little pop up in um, November, but as the number of sales go down, that means that the median price is affected by a little bit more dramatically because there's less sales that account for that midpoint. So last month, 596 sales in um, Collier County and 1,241 in Lee County. So that midpoints are 280 and 620 roughly. And as the product mix changes, 
we've seen median price stats going up, but now we're seeing median price stats going down. So the product mix is, it affects the median price, but you can see that the uh, number of units is going down, but the median price is still going up a little bit. That's canceling the effect of less units. Higher prices, but less units. So the net effect of, of a third less units, if prices hold steady or go up a little bit, is modified by the by the the the, the overall uh, coverage there, overall supply. Let's look at new listings. Seeing new listings popping back up a little bit over last month in Collier and Lee just slightly in Collier, but um, nice increase there in Lee, but still down over last year. Um, pending sales, again, um, a little bit of an uptick here in, in Collier, a little bit of an uptick over last month in Lee, but still down substantially over last year. Days on market, probably see increases, big increases over last year, which were, were over here. Let's go, to November. Let's go to November. You can see supply dropped dramatically in 2021, and now it's starting to come back up. 29 days in Collier and 19 days in Lee. And again, you can you know you can go in and um, add modifiers to this. So you can look at all property types. You can look at um, you can look at uh, price ranges, square footage sizes. So you you as you look at begin to analyze your market or or your farm or your area where your buyer is looking for, you can go in and modify these. Um, we do look at average days on market, not median. So that's 48 in Collier, 34 in, in Lee. Again, up significantly over last year. So we're starting to see the supply um, take, take over and things taking longer to sell. The other thing, let's take a look at the month's supply of inventory. Uh, again, up to 2.9 in Collier. 2.4 in Lee, significant increases over this time last year. And if we take a look at the um, percent of list price, that's another one that's kind of interesting. Let's look at the average. You can see that the percent of list price has gone from 100 up here in April and May and it's gradually gone down significantly to where we're down to, to 96 in Collier and 96.9 in Lee. What does that mean? That means that homes are not selling for their list price. They're not cascading downward, but there's a three or 4% um, difference between what the homes are asking and what they're selling for. Very important stat for, for your buyer. The buyer can say, well, you know, I'm going to wait see if I can you know get a, get the prices lower there's really no in indication uh, of that uh, in the, in the market uh, Mark has pointed out six active short sales in MLS and five foreclosed listings so there's not a huge uh, distressed property factor going on in there um, a lot very very low compared to the to the overall total. So again, prices are 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 have, there's some flexibility in here in negotiations, and maybe you can help a buyer get a reduction in their interest rate. <coughs> Excuse me, or some help in their closing costs, and that's a good sign. That's a good sign working with buyers that you may be some ability to get them not necessarily always a lower price but maybe some credits from the seller to seeing a lot of contracts come through with sellers providing credits to buyers okay price per square foot 
We don't look at that too often, but average price per square foot still going up in Collier and flattening out quite a bit in, in Lee. Um, so remember the absorption rate then is the total number of sales divided by, divided into the total number of homes for sale. So it doesn't calculate the absorption for you, but if we do a quick calculation in, in Collier, um, See what we got. We got 596 divided by 4432. So the absorption rates, um, excuse me, 596 divided by 2807. Absorption rates are around 21%. And as we, I show the absorption chart, that means that one in five houses is selling in 30 days on average. Does everybody see that? We can take the total sales in Lee, 1241, divide that by the total homes for sale, 4432, and we get a 28% absorption. So that's quite a bit better. That means better than one in four homes is selling during a month in terms of absorption of we're measuring closed sales last month to homes for sale, All right? I think that absorption is a great stat. I've started to use it a little bit more in discussions because it's a little easier to present to a seller other than what's 2.9 months of inventory. That doesn't mean a whole lot to a seller but telling, telling the seller in your neighborhood or in Lee County, one out of four homes are selling, slightly better than one out of four homes are selling in 30 days. We call your county one out of five, so. Um, so this is the audience participation part. Anybody have any comments or questions on that before we move on? No? Mark, what are you what are you seeing? Um, I think you're pretty pretty timely as far as what what I'm seeing in market. Um, it'll be interesting to see what happens with insurance um, and whether that has any effect on the market. Yeah, so this week, um, the legislature is meeting, and their sole purpose of meeting is to try to impact the insurance industry and try to get something happening to turn the tide of higher rates and low, less companies involved. Um, I was involved in a select committee for Florida Realtors for the past few weeks, and we talked to all of the experts. We talked to the uh, uh, head of uh, office insurance and regulation. We talked to the president of citizens. We talked to reinsurance people. We talked to a couple of uh, lobbyists that work in, on insurance uh, uh, related matters, and everybody said the same thing. The one-way attorney's fee needs to go. And that's basically a, a, a statute that was passed back in the um, 50s to protect the little guy from Allstate. You know, the little guy puts a claim in and the big carrier says, um, sorry, we're not going to pay that. And so what resources did the little guy have to, uh, to fight against the insurance company? Well, the one-way attorney fee allows little guy, Jeff Jones, to sue Allstate or State Farm and say, hey, you didn't, you didn't give me a fair shake on my claim. And if they look it all over and go, yeah, well, you're right. We, you're making some good points here. We, we didn't see that or we didn't have that fact. So we're going to pay you more. Well, if it was a dollar more, Allstate also had to pay my attorney's fees, which seemed like a, a way of protecting a little bit of David and Goliath stuff. But what happened was the, the ambitious, too many overpopulation of attorneys in Florida decided, wait a minute, hold it. If we can get Jeff Jones to assign his benefits to us, we can sue the insurance company and we're going to ask for 
big dollars because there's no regulation on how much we can ask for. So we see for a, a thirty thousand dollar water claim, they get a hundred hundred thousand dollars in attorney fees. And there's no there was no way to really stop that because the attorney said, "Here's how much time I spent. Here's my costs. I want to be reimbursed." So last year, the insurance companies paid seventy one cents out of every claim dollar to an attorney. They paid eight cents to the policyholder. So it's, it's out of control. And as we began to close the loopholes on assignment of benefits for insurance claims, and the last step in that is that it, an attorney cannot collect fees uh, if, they, if, you know, if they're on the one-way attorney fee basis. In other words, if they, if they file a claim and win, still the complainant has to uh, to pay for their side of the, the legal fee. So it's not so much of a deep incentive for everybody to turn around and sue insurance companies. There's still over 100,000 lawsuits in Florida against insurance companies. So it's going to take a little while if they're able to be successful in repealing this legislation. It's still going to take a while for all of that to flush out of the system. So that means rates are not going to catapult down, but they should start a descent descending of the trajectory by the end of the year because as policies renew then they'll be they'll, they'll, they won't have that statute to uh to to be in play so fingers crossed toes crossed arms crossed legs crossed that was the only solution that anybody gave us when as a panel that would work in florida you know there's a bunch of stats we run across but in most states, all state and state farm make up 30 to 35% of the total policies. In Florida, that's less than eight. So the big guys that can absorb the losses because of their size and their totality, they don't have to go out and buy a bunch of reinsurance. They're set up to manage risk across a large spectrum. So if a hurricane Ian hits, they can pay it because they've collected the money intelligently over all sources of hurricanes and all sources in Florida. So what happens in Florida now is there are no major insurance carriers to any extent. So we got a lot of little guys in there that maybe have a hundred million dollars worth of capitalization, which seems like a lot of money until they have to write five or six hundred million dollars in policies to, to make a profit. <coughs> Excuse me. Still getting over a little cold here. Um, so they, they, what they do is they go out on the market and they buy reinsurance. And reinsurance covers the difference between their capital base and what the claims come in at. Great. Except reinsurance costs have now reached 40% of policy costs for those companies that have to use reinsurance to, to be able to write the volume they do. So... I, I know I've, you've asked me what time it is. I'm telling you how to make a watch. But um, it, it's important to understand that there is no insurance company in Florida that's making any money at all. They're all in the red. So the idea is that the big, bad insurance companies are denying all these claims and not paying out in order to line their pockets just isn't true. It isn't supported by the, by the financial data for the policyholders. So if we're able to get the attorney fees under control, we feel like some of the big carriers uh, who like Florida, um, they write a lot of auto in Florida, uh, that will come back into the homeowner's market and we'll be able to spread the risk out and not have to everything be reinsurance. And they should be able by that time to, to be able to bring the rates down, be more poly, more sources of capital in Florida will bring the rates down because there'll be more opportunities um and the guy from citizen said they don't pass this re repeal of one-way insurance you'll have one phone number to call and that'll be citizens so for those of you that are aware of citizens it was formed as a as an insurer of last resort a few years ago for those that you know lived on the coast and had no other carrier would take a risk but now 
they've gone from 400,000 policies two years ago to over a million two policies headed to 2 million. Uh, that's a majority of the population of homeowner policies in Florida. So um, it's not a good scene. We feel like the, uh, the governor has a lot of political capital by virtue of his election. And we feel like the Speaker of the House and the President of the Senate, Kathleen Pasadomo, or Kathleen, are all in the an alignment that this has to be done. And we're hoping that, uh, you know, much of the Senate is trial lawyers. So we're hoping that they have the momentum to uh, get this passed this week. And if so, you might finally start to see some relief in Florida. If not, as Mark points out, the inavailability of, of insurance at a reasonable price, we're already on average paying three times the national rate for homeowners coverage. You know, that's going to stop, start to impact people, especially who are financing. You know, if all of a sudden your insurance is, you know, another seven or eight or $10,000 a year, you divide that up by month and it's, it's a big number. So that can affect your affordability and it can affect how much you want to pay. And so help give us hope. Say a little prayer for insurance in Florida this week. So any other questions or comments? Okay, so what is there any area of the contract that you have had a recent experience with or um, that you'd like to discuss or do you want me to, to, to dive into a, a subject here and see what we can do? Brian, anything going on in your world contract-wise you'd like to discuss? Sadly, no, not really. Um, so that's why I, for you as the broker, uh, my question would be, what are you seeing most that you think needs to be addressed that's a really common thing? You know, okay. to make it life easier and ours. Yeah, there's, a, there's, there's still a lot of gnashing of teeth over inspection items. What's cosmetic, what's defective? Um, and in an as-is contract, there is no definition of cosmetic or defective. So we could talk a little bit about that today. Paula, anything that you'd like to discuss contract-wise? Are you there, Paula? Okay, no problem. Mark, what about you? What have you seen recently in contract negotiations, issues that you'd like to like to discuss today? Uh, let's see. I, I guess the issues around, uh, and I think I discussed this with you about, about the, the, the time frame between the end of the inspection period, the conveyance of the buyer's election for repairs, and the short maybe window of time to get repairs done. And if you can't get that done, then the provisions in both of the contracts about either setting aside monies or having um, a credit, that sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, that's that's an issue that, that, that you know, with timeliness, you know, inspection periods are be, in contracts have become incredibly short. I probably see the average today being seven days well seven days you have to get the inspector out there which is usually not a problem there's plenty of inspectors but then they you get that report and then you get it you have a period of time where you have to figure out you know what's cosmetic what's defective and what do i want to ask for and if i want to ask for a credit you know i the neighbor contract and the far bar contract are both very consistent that if i'm going to ask you for a credit I got to back it up with some detail there that shows that I've gone to licensed contractors and that I've gotten re estimates. We had a case the other day where the, the, the buyer requested a credit, but didn't submit any estimates. And the seller offered him a smaller credit back based on their knowledge of what that would cost. And then the buyer wanted to walk. And I said, uh, I don't know that the buyer can walk because they didn't 
fulfill their obligation under the uh, buyer's request. Let's take a look at that document real quick here if we can. Okay, I'm gonna go here. And I'm gonna go to... I guess my feedback is when things start to go sideways, call broker Jeff. Yeah, well, that's okay. Broker Jeff's been pretty busy on the phones lately. Um, and sometimes I'm not quite as close to the fire as you guys are. So I can sometimes come up with something intelligent. Um, but for the most part, you know, you, 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 you're, you're working for your customer, either on the listing side or the sell side, and you're, um, you're, you're advocating for them. So you gotta, I mean, you know, you can't ignore the fact that you gotta follow the, the procedures I'm going to bring up a couple of documents here for NABOR. Um, there's one. And there's two. All right. Go back here, share, and see what we got. Okay. Let me do the uh, share the other one here. One more share. There, that's better. Can everybody see that okay? Yes. I'm sorry. Yes, yes, you can, can see, see it okay? It. Yep. Okay. Um, this is the new version that was released last week. And you notice in red at the top, we, we've had it in there in many different forms. We've chosen all red and all caps to say, please don't use this with an as-is contract. They'll still see it a lot. Um, but, you know, notice that uh, you have an enabler contract, standard contract, you have five days after the end of your inspection period to submit this to the, to the uh, seller. The seller then has 10 days to respond. Now you can shorten those time periods up as you see fit in, by in you know, just making some notes in the, uh, after, in the uh, other terms and conditions, the buyer shall have three days to submit their request. The seller shall have five days to respond. I've seen that done a fair amount or some, but bottom line is you got to click this list of systems and equipment. If you have a radon problem or a termite problem or a mold problem, you got to specify that. And then you got to go to the next page and, and indicate you got to supply the entire inspection report, right? And you want to supply a list. Uh, it doesn't have, there's a form we have for a list. You can put in any list you want. But you can't just sling the inspection report over there and say, hey, fix all this, because that's not the spirit of the, of the process. The spirit of the process is you send over a list of things that you believe to be defective as defined in the contract, and the seller has an uh, opportunity to check box A and say, I accept everything as to the defective inspection items only. I'm not under any obligation. So I can literally draw a line through those items that you've requested that I do that are not defective under the contract. And I'm still able to check box A and the buyer does not have the option to cancel. If I put a credit in down here, notice it says equivalent to the estimated cost of remedial action for the identified defective inspection items 
as evidenced by the attached written estimates issued to buyer by appropriately licensed people. So if you put $10,000 in there and you don't provide any backup for all that, um, does the seller have an obligation to fix any of that or to give you that credit? So that's a, that's a question that I see happening. Um, the seller should always attempt to check box A because in box A, they're agreeing to, uh, uh, to address defective inspection items only, either through the credit or through the um, response that I'll fix them, I'll have them fixed. Um, and then there's, there's no option for the buyer to cancel. What I see though is the seller goes down and you ask for 10,000, the seller checks C, 5,000, and note if it's a seller response or B or C to any defective inspection items, buyer may terminate the sales contract not later than five days after the earlier of the buyer's receipt or the end of the seller's response deadline. So checking box B and C can be a little risky for a seller. Uh, you know, you're always going to argue a little bit over what's defective and what's cosmetic. So if the seller's agreeing to do address, you know, defective items only, my suggestion is have the seller check box A. It's the burden of proof is on the buyer to prove that those lines that the seller has drawn through for, for grout, crack tiles and cracks in the driveway and those kinds of things which are not considered defective in the contract, that's the, the buyer's obligation to prove that, not the inspector's opinion. <coughs> the buyer's requirement to prove that these items they're requesting are, are part of the contract. So let's go and actually we'll jump into the contract here real quick if I can find it, there it is. Let's see if I can share that. Okay, can everybody see that okay? So because I've read this so many times, if you get on to, I think it's 299, but I think I've sent some slides out to people that just capture this paragraph. If you'd like that, I can do it. But basically this is describing the inspection process, right? There's your, not later than 10 days. There's your buyers having five days, but it's in here that 295 to 306, it's in here where everything's well-defined. So the systems and equipment are placed in working condition. The air conditioner is cooling to the proper differential. Uh, if there was radon, the radon test now shows us below four. Uh, Lead-based paint, we don't have too much an issue with. Uh, termites, toxic or pathogenic molds are no longer present after retesting. Um, open permits there. So, I mean, this is where the rubber meets the road as far as defining what's defective and what's not. So on 307, we say, you know, if it's, if it's working in the condition it's designed to operate, the air conditioning is cooling to 19 degrees, which is the, the operating uh, conditions for this particular model of air conditioner. The cover's a little rusty outside. The, the unit looks pretty good inside, probably needs cleaning, but it's working. It's in working condition. The roof, ceiling, interior and exterior doors and walls, foundation, shall be in working condition of structurally sound, watertight, and free from wood rot. So you have to look at what people are asking for and what the inspector is pointing out. And if they're saying, well, there's some surface cracks in the driveway, or there's some, some settlement cracks, you know, on one, some of the walls, they're not structural, then they're structurally sound, watertight, and they're good. So make sure your, your seller understands that, that they're not obligated to uh, 
address items that are considered on this list um, to be cosmetic. So look at the 30310 cosmetic condition defined as an aesthetic imperfection does not affect the working dish of the item. Corrosion, tears, worn spots, discoloration of floor covering or wallpaper or window treatments, missing or torn screens. I see tons of things. Replace the screens. Sorry. No, no. Nail holes, scratches, dents, chips, caulking, pitted pool surfaces, minor cracks in windows, driveways, sidewalks. I see a lot of that pointed out. Um, cracked roof tiles, not missing roof tiles, but cracked roof tiles, curling or worn shingles, as long as there's no evidence that the roof is leaky. So I've got a slide with this paragraph in it, and I've encouraged people, if they're in a dispute with the other side, to the listing agent and the, the, the buyers requested a bunch of cosmetic things, send this over to them. Say, what part of this cosmetic don't you, don't you get? And the answer will be, well, you can always ask. The worst you can say is no. I'm not sure that I 100% subscribe to that philosophy um, because there's the relationship involved. And if you are a uh, representing a seller and the buyer sends over a bunch of ticky tack nitpicking stuff and then turns out and says, well, I really know. Thanks for that. I really need to extend my deposit date or my closing date. You're, you're building angst and friction into the relationship. I personally, when I've been involved and the buyer says, I'm paying a lot of money for this, ask for all these things. I'm saying, no, if you do that, you run the risk of, of, of creating a friction relation, the friction in the relationship, and you may need a break later on. So I wouldn't do it. We're talking about minor handyman stuff, normal wear and tear, settlement issues, um, this just in, all these homes are built on sand <laughs> and the sand shifts a little bit. So there you go. All right. Well, I have been yakking. So does anybody have anything to say? I'll add that uh, things like uh, pavers on a pool deck yep. and other issues like mold remediation, drywall repairs now, trying to find anybody to do drywall. All those things uh, oftentimes take much longer than the period of for the closing date. So being knowledgeable about the escrow amounts or getting the seller and the buyer to agree to a, to a settlement instead of escrowing the funds, if you can get, negotiate that, then that might be a, a little cleaner if, if both parties can agree. I think yeah, a, lot I, of buyer, a lot of buyers don't want to get into the money pit and find out that if there's something behind the wall and they agree to a settle, you know, to, to either split the difference or accept an amount from the seller. And they find out after the fact that there was a lot of uh, additional work that needs to be done. They feel like they've been stiffed. Well, the, the, um, the escrowing, part is very specific right that it says that the escrow sum is not a cap when the look at 331 for sellers may not the escrow sum is not on a cap is not a cap on the seller's liability to complete the remedial action so i think it's important you know to take that into account if there's work that has to be done and you're not sure as to the scope of it and you know maybe you need to go and get an estimate of what that is so that you can deal intelligently with the seller. If you got an estimate from a contractor that says, here's what it's gonna take, could be more, could be a little less, then at least you have a number, but trying to negotiate a credit with a seller when you don't have your ducks in a row can leave you exactly as Mark's saying, can leave you with um, um, a, a bad taste in your mouth because now you have to pay for things that you shouldn't have had to pay for in the first place. And then I guess the flip side of that is when the agent takes on the responsibility of getting the estimates and, and choosing the which contractor to go to to get the estimate, 
um, then there's another slippery slope. For sure, the, the, the buyer's estimate generally comes in higher than the seller's because the seller's trying to make sure they're the most frugal. The buyer's trying to make sure they get the best contractor who might not you know, feel the same way about the estimate. So there's always a little friction. And if our bar, there's a, a referee in there, they agree on a third party to come in, make the estimate, and then they have to agree to that estimate. So it's an interesting uh, question, and, and you're right. I mean, there's the trades are busy right now, some with new construction, some with repairs for me, and, and so trying to get this work done, you know, in a couple, three weeks can be tough, especially radon mitigation, mold remediation, even closing or open permits can take quite a bit longer than... Um, than the time it might take to close. So there you, you're on, do you want to extend the closing? No, I don't want to do that. But I, I also don't want to be on the hook for repairs that I make that may be more in, ex, extensive when they get into a wall or they start testing a piece of equipment and find out there's you know electrical issues, that sort of thing. So it, it, it is a, it's a difficult time. So, but I, I, I guess in the best practices, I would always recommend that a buyer maybe get their own estimate so at least they have an idea of what now a lot of times you find stuff that's you know it's the day of closing we had one the other day where the water heater blew up and soaked the carpet in the closet and what do you do um we had to get estimates and then the seller was like i'm not paying that much and I'm like, well here's the contract 200 percent of what we think it's going to cost so it all worked out but the issues can create friction, frayed nerves, screaming, yelling, all of those symptoms. So try to remember as the real estate professional that you were remain, remaining calm at all times. Well, and sometimes you have to hold the phone out to hear in order to protect your eardrums. But, you know, whatever you need to do to try to say, okay, let's be cool here. Buyers want to buy, sellers want to sell. What can we do to keep keep the situation together? So I think, it, and what also goes with that is is finding good tradespeople that will do small jobs. So, right. Uh, keep those relationships close, and keep your ears open for other agents who have had good experiences with contractors or handyman or whatever tradespeople. Yep. Uh, don't act as a general contractor. You're not hiring them. They're dealing directly with the either the buyer or the seller you're simply facilitating communications yeah so uh if you follow the facebook page periodically you'll see some testimonials on there i put a few contractors in there that have had done really good job uh but you know it, it's a pretty good source to say hey does anybody have a, a great handyman or a great painter or whatever uh, oftentimes you can get a recommendation from our group that's pretty good. And we do have obviously a list of preferred vendors that, that, you know, we, we, we look to them because they're helping support our events and we look to them to uh, maybe gain, gain some business from doing that. So there you go. All right. Well, you know, guys, my throat's a little dry. Um, I'm, I'm back to 90%, but I'm not quite a hundred percent. So if it's okay with you, I think I'll sign off a little early today. Um, if, is there anything else um, that you'd like to discuss, Brian or Paula or, or Mark? No, Jeff, I just had a question uh, from last week when we were going over the new contracts. Uh-huh. Did you say you were able to, if I send you an email to send me out the, um, like the red line, the red copy, lines? your template, yep. if I could get a copy, I'll, I'll you send bet. you an email when we're done. You bet. I, you. Can, I can send you the red lines right away. No problem. Okay. Thank you for today. Also appreciate it. Sir. All right. Great. Mark, anything you need? That's it. Thank you. Okay. Paula, have a good day. Thanks for joining. Look, look for a text from me, Jeff. I, I, yeah, I need to, I owe you a phone call about the, the, uh, yeah, super. Yeah. Okay. okay. We'll do. Thanks. Thanks.